Good morning, everyone. Um, when I was approached by OMSA to come and talk to about leadership, I thought, how do you talk to leaders about leadership? It's almost like talking to a group of mothers about rearing children. So the challenge is on, but I will do my best. I'm going to set my remarks in the context of the AODA, but what I'm really hoping to, to parlay to you is some things that you need to think about as leaders as our province evolves and changes. Currently, about 1.65 million people in Ontario have a disability, which represents about one in seven people. By 2036, this number will increase to one in five. Basically, if you think about it in Canadian terms, we're talking the combined populations of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Our population is aging, and by 2017, folks, which is right around the corner, there will be more people over the age of 65 than there will be kids under the age of 14. So the work you're doing as leaders is going to change rapidly. The, the other thing that's happening, and Mr. Siegel mentioned, was about the aging population and the fact that people are continuing to age and live longer. As leaders, what you're going to be faced with is the baby boomers. And baby boomers are educated, they know what they want, and they know how to get it. And, and later I'm going to talk about the need for consultation and how you do it. But I have to tell you that it will no longer be, you will no longer be able to have a focus group of three or four people in a room and to say that you've had a decision. The internet has put us to the point where literally tens of thousands of people in large municipalities will and will have and will want to have their say. By 2031, there will be over 6 million people over the age of 65, over the age of 55. By 2031, OMSA will be 80 years old. Your work will look entirely different than it looks today. Accessibility is in fact good for everyone. It simply is a means of giving people of all abilities opportunities to participate fully in everyday life. Very much, Mr. Siegel talked about financial, I'm going to talk about actual participation. It's time that we change the discussion from disabilities, which we did for a number of years. We're now on the, to the discussion of accessibility, and we will not have completed our journey until we have a fulsome discussion about social inclusion. A socially inclusive society is one where all people feel valued for their differences, are respected, and their basic needs are met so that they can live in dignity. Accessibility benefits everyone. Mr. Siegel talked about returning money to the uh, um, economy. Uh, you know, when I was at social services for many years and I worked in the employment area, I truly believed that a job was the answer to everything. I would say to you today, as working in, in social services, it isn't the job, it's the paycheck. If the ability to earn money and to be able to walk in a store, to be able to go to an event like you went last night, to be able to actually participate, it is not the job that allows for the participation. It is, in fact, the paycheck. When we think about accessibility, and we leave it in terms of disabilities, we leave ourselves out. All of us use accessibility every day. I would tell you that last Saturday when you went to get your groceries and you had five or six bags in your hands, you looked for the blue button. That's accessibility. When you go to the airport and you take the magic mat, mat so that you don't have to take, especially in the Toronto airport where you go for your luggage for miles and miles and miles, that's accessibility. The, the, the other one that I want to talk about is something that all of us have, become, have adapted to. And it started with CP24. When we watch CP24, we participate in closed captioning. 
And I go to conferences like this, and I've used pictures today, I, because I'm a former president, I wanted to show you that I know you're all doing great work. But when I watch CP24, and I then come to conferences, I see what people are doing. They're re watching the, the captioning at the side. We have become a closed caption society. We're all doing it every day. D the, the, all of this is really universal design. And universal design makes things safer, easier, more convenient for everyone. It involves designing products and spaces so that all of us can participate. It's not just about curb cuts, it's about every aspect of our lives. My challenge to you when you go back to your offices on Wednesday or Thursday, unless you're taking a couple of days off, which probably would be what I would do, I would suggest to you that you look with a new eye to actually look where you see accessibility and not what it means to the person with a disability, but what it means to you. Everyone knows about our, our act, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking to you about the elements of, of the, the AODA. I know that all of you were trained on the AODA, or I wouldn't have come here today. So thank you for being trained and for doing that. You have been on this journey a long time. You were there with us during the ODA, and you're here with us on the AD, A AODA. Your work, as I've demonstrated in the pictures that I've shown you, is really resemblant of the core principles that were used in my introduction. We're now going to talk about independence, dignity, integration, and the equality of opportunity. And how bringing these is the best, and how do you bring these about in the best way? As leaders of human services, I want to challenge you to think about consultation. It is absolutely imperative that you consult with your constituents. The best programs in Ontario in any human services are designed from the bottom up. They are not made, the decisions of human participation and social inclusion are not made in Ottawa and they're not made in Queen's Park. They are made in community centres similar to this one. That's where the best decisions are made. As leaders, I want to, to challenge you in a different way. The most successful accessibility advisory committees in this province have one thing in common. It is imperative that all of you in this room as leaders help your citizenry get acquainted with your mayors and your councils. You are, they are the most successful when the champion goes to the table in the council. I want to give you an example, an exemplary example of where this is best, best des described. In the town of Huntsville, they have a local AAC. The first thing that they, they do is when you go to the community center, you know the, the G8, the, the beautiful G8 center the, that they built in, in uh, Huntsville, when you go through the door of that center, the first thing you see is a door that says Accessibility Advisory Committee. Imagine the impact on kids five years old going into arena and seeing the word accessibility. It says to everyone in that community, this is important to us. In that community, the person who's their champion is a woman by the name of Deb Kerwin. And Deb Kerwin has convinced, as a citizen, that she sit at the council table, not in the back room. She sits at the table. And when issues come before the council, she comments on whether it's accessible and will meet the needs of the community. This is on Rogers TV. Think of the power of that consultation process. I would say to you, all of you, try to make that happen in your communities where citizens are getting their, their voices heard. Consultation is the voice that helps transform the lives of people with disabilities and in fact drives social inclusions. 
as we, as, as a small, if, if you're a large municipality, over 10,000, you have to have an AAC. I would say to you, take your local advisory committee and see where else there's synergies. In my opinion, the first place to start for all of you is eight matching age-friendly communities with accessibility advisory committees. The dialogue of those two groups will push your community agenda miles. If you're a smaller community and don't have a local AAC, it is incumbent on you as leaders to have some way for people to, to, to express their voice. A really great example in, in this, in southwestern Ontario, where there are a number of communities in Huron County that don't have the size to have an AAC. They have an informal network and in fact have decided that if you're a person living in Clinton, you should have access to the same services, the same program delivery as if you were in Godridge. Another great example of from the down up, where the community decided on how their community would look. I want to talk about, to give you some examples, on each of the standards within the, within the AODA and how they reflect leadership and how they reflect change. The customer service standard, the best example I can give you is the, is the Stop Gap Initiative in, in Ontario. I don't know how many of you are familiar. You, I'll, tell you, you're, I'll tell you how you're familiar with it. You probably heard the outrage in Toronto about the ramp that was placed at the Signs Restaurant and it was one, it was one millimeter over the allowable distance. The huge outrage in the city, you're breaking laws, et cetera, et cetera. The ramps initiative though, and if you, if you know this program, it's basically ramps that are that take you into stores about this high. They're always bright, huge colors, and there's a reason for that, and I'll get into it in a minute. But the ramps are really not about accessibility. The ramps say to people in the community, you are welcome. You are welcome here. You are welcome to participate, to shop, et cetera, et cetera. That program that started by a fellow who happens to be in a wheelchair is now in Prince Edward Island, five cities in British Columbia. It's a part of Hamilton in the uh, Barton Street area, which is close to where the soccer will be played for the Pan Am Parapan Games. But it is an example of one man's idea that generated because he knew that customer service was a key to social inclusion. The next one I want to talk to you about is about the uh, standard for employment and uh, employment. Employment, and I said to you before, it isn't, the, it, isn't the it isn't just the job, it's the paycheck. But the truth is, and here's the challenge for you, and I don't need to tell this group because I know you've been in the trenches in Ontario Works and ODSP employment for years, but you have another challenge in your communities that I want all of you to think about and to face. Currently in this province, there are 46,000 kids attending college and university who have a disability. They are coming out of university to the, to the rate of th three times more likely to be unemployed than their able-bodied counterparts. As an aside, I want to tell you, if you're a person in this province and you are blind, you have a 70% chance of being unemployed. Kids who go to university with disabilities, and this is the thing I want you to think about, kids that go to university with disabilities, on average, take five years to get a degree that able-bodied kids take four years for. Therefore, the cost of their education, now it's not totally on tuition because the tuition gets modified, but they spend five years on lodging, food, et cetera, et cetera, that kids who are able-bodied don't. And they're coming out at disappointing rates of employment. 
On the level of employment, and, if, and I want you, if there's certain things in a presentation I want you to remember, I want you to remember this, and it comes from something that David Onley says. In, if you're a person with a disability, you're three times more likely to be unemployed than, than, than employed. The unemployment rate currently is around seven to eight percent. So that makes it for a person with a disability about 24 percent. And I can tell you it's much higher than that, but let's use that as a figure. In the Great Depression, the unemployment rate was 25 percent. If it's 25 percent in the Great Depression and we were outraged as a society, this is my challenge to you as leaders. Why are we not outraged that people with disabilities are at an unemployment rate of 25%? So as leaders, take that home in thinking of the programs that you're, that you're investing in and creating. I want also to talk about transportation and the enlightening I had in the, trans okay, in the transportation area. I always believed that a job was the most important thing in life. I now believe it's a, a, the paycheck is more important. I also believe that having a roof over your head was important. But the key to social inclusion is transportation. If you cannot get there, you cannot participate. So my challenge to you as leaders as you're developing your human so services processes is to always put transportation at the table. You can have all the programs in the world and they can all be great, but if you cannot get there, you cannot participate. As, we, as I close, because I've got the five minute mark, I want to uh, leave you with two things. One is I want to go back to this issue of the ground up decision making. And I want to give you two examples to meet the same ends and why they're both effective. In the town of Wasega Beach, they made a decision to have Moby mats. They are so proud of those Moby mats. And if you've read anything I've written or, or, or things we've produced, we always have the picture of the Moby mat because it really is about social inclusion. It's about being able to get on the beach. You know, there are people who haven't been on the beach with their families or their grandchildren who can now do that. In this town of, of the city of Sudbury, they decided that they, their beach access would be big wheeled wheelchairs, et cetera, et cetera. Neither are wrong, neither are right. But what is right about both of them is the community decided on what their community should look like. And as leaders, that's what you have to ensure, that the community decides what their community should look like. And finally, I want to leave you with this thought. I've had the pleasure in my life of working with First Nation communities. And if you know anything about First Nations people, they always come from the place of the positive. And they, we had a project with them three years ago. And their project, and my, my last message to you is this, their project was called Honoring All Abilities. And as human service managers, I would ask that all of you honor all abilities. Thank you.